the white man pays Reverend Martin Luther King, subsidizes Reverend Martin Luther King, so that Reverend Martin Luther King can continue to teach the Negroes to be defenseless. That's what you mean by nonviolent. Be defenseless. Be defenseless in the face of one of the most cruel uh, beasts that has ever taken the people into captivity. That's this American white man. And they have proved it throughout the country by the police dogs and the police clubs. A uh, hundred years ago, they used to put on a white sheet and use a bloodhound against Negroes. Today, they have taken off the white sheet and put on police uniforms. They've uh, traded in the bloodhounds for police dogs, and they're still doing the same thing. And just as Uncle Tom, back during slavery, used to keep the Negroes from resisting the bloodhound or resisting the Ku Klux Klan by teaching them to, to love their enemy or pray for those who use them despitefully. Today, uh, Martin Luther King is just a 20th century or modern Uncle Tom or a religious Uncle Tom who is doing the same thing today to keep Negroes defenseless in the face of attack that Uncle Tom did on the plantation to keep those Negroes defenseless in the, in the face of the attack of the Klan in that Well, day. I don't think of uh, love as, uh, in this context, as emotional bosh. I don't think of it as uh, a weak force, but I, I think of love as something strong and that uh, organizes itself into powerful uh, direct action. Now, this is what I try to teach in the struggle in the South, that uh, we are not engaged uh, in a struggle that means we sit down and do nothing. Uh, that there's a great deal of difference between non-resistance to evil and non-violent resistance. Uh, Non-resistance leaves, uh, leaves you in a state of stagnant passivity and deadman complacency, wherein non-violent resistance means that you do resist in a very strong and determined manner. And I think some of the uh, criticisms of uh, non-violence, or some of the critics, fail to realize uh, that we are talking about something very strong, and they confuse non-resistance with non -violence. The goal of Dr. Martin Luther King is to give Negroes a chance to sit in a segregated restaurant beside the same white man who had brutalized them for 400 years. The goal of Dr. Martin Luther King is to get Negroes to forgive the people who have brutalized them for, uh, for 400 years by by lulling them to sleep and making them forgetting what those whites have done to them. But the masses of black people in America today don't go for what Martin Luther King is, is putting down. As you said in one of your articles, it's psychologically insecure, something of that sort. I forget how you put it. But you didn't endorse what Martin Luther King was doing yourself. Uh, I do not reject his goals of full integration and full equality rights for American citizens. Do you reject these goals? If you goals? don't think that he's walking on the right road, I'm quite sure you don't agree that he'll get to the right place. And if you would classify uh, his method as uh, psychologically unrealistic, I think that uh, if a man's method is psychologically unrealistic, which means the road or the means or the method that he's using, I think as a psychologist, you, you'd be very doubtful I don't think that he would reach true. the right. If anyone has ever lived with a nonviolent movement in the South, from Montgomery on through the Freedom Rides and through the sit-in movement and the recent Birmingham movement and see the reactions of many of the uh, extremists and reactionaries in the white community, uh, he wouldn't say that this movement makes, uh, or this philosophy makes them comfortable. Uh, I think it arouses uh, a sense of shame within them often in many instances. I think it uh, does something to cut, touch the conscience and uh, establish a sense of guilt. Now, so often people respond to guilt by engaging more in the guilt evoking act in an attempt to drown the sense of guilt. But this, uh, this approach certainly uh, doesn't make the white man feel comfortable. I think it disturbs the other thing. This, uh, conscience and uh, it, uh, it disturbs this, this sense of contentment. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And uh, with the Supreme Court, if the NAACP can tell me that they want a desegregation decision for me uh, 10 years ago, but yet the schools haven't been desegregated, as I say, this is a victory with no victory. Uh, it's a victory that you can talk about, but it's a victory you can't show me. So if you represent the NAACP and you are telling me about this great victory you won for me, when I look at you, I have to uh, conclude that either you have been duped yourself or else you are trying to dupe me. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain.
practical gain that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years. I don't think there's any real organization to the riots. I think they grow out of the conditions that I've mentioned uh, all along. And as long as these intolerable conditions are there, as long as the Negro finds himself living every day in a major depression, uh, then uh, every city will sit on a, a powder keg and can explode over the slightest incident. I feel that killing is a very tragic way to deal with any social problem. There is no violent solution to the problem that the Negro confronts in this country. And this is why I have constantly said that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. After all, the Negro ends up uh, on the losing end. We can't win a violent revolution. Most of the persons killed in riots are Negroes themselves. Uh, the persons who end up not being able to get uh, milk for their children of Negroes uh, because things where they have to live are destroyed. So there's no uh, practical or moral answer uh, in the realm of violence to the Negroes' problem. But I do understand the sociological, the psychological, and the economic the reasons. The problem can be solved. First, the white man and the black man have to be able to sit down at the same table. The white man has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of that Negro. And the so-called Negro has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of the white man. Then they can bring the issues that are under the rug out on top of the table and take an intelligent approach to get the problem solved. That's the only way that they'll ever do it. We need an action program while we are Muslim, or while we are Christian, or while we are whatever we are. We still need an action program that will eliminate these evils that are in our community. This is what we're trying to do with the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Do you consider yourself militant? <laughs> I consider myself Malcolm. <laughs> well, I think we uh, have to agree that uh, this appears to be uh, the result of an internal conflict within the black nationalist movement. So I think the first thing that needs to be done is for a conference of goodwill to take place between uh, black nationalist leaders. This was why I suggested a few days ago that the followers of the late Malcolm X and the followers of Elijah Muhammad uh, should sit down at the peace table together, so to speak, uh, and discuss this problem and try to reach some understanding. Uh, I don't think, uh, and I'm sure, uh, that uh, nothing can be accomplished by violence. Uh, it only leads to new and more complex social problems. I think it is unfortunate uh, for the black nationalist movement. I think it is unfortunate for the health of our nation. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I, I'm really happy for you. I'm going to let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. 